All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. This week, we are going to talk about elder abuse and elder victimization. As always, I would encourage you to take notes. This is a shorter presentation. I'm going to try to uh, keep it shorter for you, um, which means that inherently I won't be covering everything in the chapter. So please make sure you read, but I will be highlighting the important parts. All right. Let's go ahead and get started. So before we kind of define elder abuse, I wanted to bring this to your attention. Statistics and empirical evidence show us that older adults are the least likely to become victims of violent crimes in the United States. So remember when we talked about victimization and who is more likely to become a victim, elders are the least likely. Um, and when they do become victims of crime, it's mostly property crime. Uh, and it's typically 65 and older uh, that become victims of property crime. And we're going to talk a little bit about that here in just a minute. So let's talk about the definition of elder abuse. Now, your book gives a very simplified definition from the World Health Organization. I'm going to kind of expand a little bit on that. Um, but our definition for elder abuse does come from the World Health Organization. And essentially, elder abuse is a single or repeated act or lack of appropriate action occurring within any relationship where there is an expectation of trust, which causes harm or distress to an older person. It can be various forms, such as physical, psychological, emotional, sexual, financial, um, or simply reflect intentional or unintentional neglect. So you will see that uh, the categories of or the types of abuse is very similar to what we've talked about before with child abuse, with the addition of financial abuse is uh, a key component in elder abuse. But you will see that it actually um, also includes neglect, and we're going to talk a little bit about neglect as well. So there is some definitional confusion because when I ask you what do you what do you consider elderly? What age do you consider to be elderly? Um you have to be very careful with that um just because you know people that are that are certain ages. So um there is difficulty in defining elder or older adult um, AARP considers an older adult to be the age of 50 or older. Um, abuse victims later in life also include persons who have attained the age of 50. Um, so when we look at intimate partner violence, we're looking at 50 and older for older adult. The National Center on Elder Abuse uh, refers to an older adult who is age 60 and above. And the Bureau of Justice Statistics classifies older adults as 65 and above. So you see that there's a lot of different um, minimum age uh, limits when it comes to who is defined as an older adult. So typically, um, older adult abuse is defined to include individuals who are 60 to 65 and older. So if you're under 60, you're considered just a regular adult um, in most cases, uh, even though AARP considers an older adult 50. When we're talking about uh, crimes and, and just the general social um, acceptance of the term older adult, we're really um, looking at 60 to 65 as that uh, minimum cutoff. Uh, and there's, again, I can't give you a full, like, it is 65 and above or 60 and above, just because um, the National Center on Elder Abuse and the and BJS doesn't really um, agree on that. So we're looking at 60 to 65 and above. So how common is elder abuse? Your book will give you certain statistics. Um, the World Health Organization estimates the rate of older uh, of elder abuse across Canada, the Netherlands, and the United States uh, is between four and six percent. 
Um, a recently released U.S. nationally representative sample found that 5.1% of adults over the age of 60 reported emotional mistreatment. 5.2% financial abuse, 1.6% physical, and 0.6% sexual. So you, you will see that roughly about 5% of the elder population report abuse. And that, um, it's hard to kind of tell because um, elder abuse is very private and the nature of elder abuse makes it difficult to determine. We're going to talk about um, the categories of abuse, and a lot of abuse you will see comes from children um, or private institutions. And so um, that brings some challenges around gathering statistical and empirical data to truly talk about the prevalence of elder abuse. Um, I will say it is estimated that the number of investigations of elder abuse may increase by 50% um, in in 2030, just because our elder population is growing substantially and there is a growing like spotlight around uh, this population. As you read, um, you'll notice that elder abuse is not necessarily a new thing. However, the spotlight around labeling elder um, is. Uh, Burgess talks about how the term elder abuse first um, showed up in medical literature in the 70s, and it wasn't until the, until the 80s, late 80s, that we truly got legislation. In fact, in 1987, which is, fun fact, the year that I was born, um, don't roll your eyes, uh, we got the first true um, piece of legislation that defined what elder abuse was. And that is the Federal Older Americans Act. And it provides definitions for elder abuse and it directs federal funds to investigate and um, prevent this type of abuse. Then in 2010, we got the Elder Justice Act. And essentially the Elder Justice Act um, requires the reporting of activities, accomplishments, and challenges around elder abuse um, it made the recommendations to different co congressional committees, and um, it provides states with resources to prevent uh, elder abuse and increase um, prosecution, and it provides victim assistance to elder abuse victims. So the Older Americans Act and the Elder Justice Act are the two main pieces of legislation that uh, we look to when we're talking about elder abuse. I will say that all states have enacted legislation authorizing the use of adult protective services, um, including Georgia. And I will actually link um, the APS website into the folio this week so that you'll be able to kind of look around on that website and see uh, kind of what they do. Remember when we talked about child abuse, we talked about child protective services. Well, APS is the same thing except it's targeted toward adults. And fun fact, up until probably the early 2000s, DFACTS investigated both uh, adult and child victims. So APS and CPS were housed under um, defects in Georgia um, until the early 2000s and then it got broke off and Adult Protective Services is its own department. But essentially Adult Protective Services are the service providers to older adults and people with disabilities who are in danger of being mistreated or neglected or are unable to protect themselves and have <clears throat> no one to assist them. All states have APS programs, just like all states have child protective services. And in most states, APS is the first responder for allegations of abuse and, or neglect against older adults. You will see in Georgia, APS is not the first responder. Um, in fact, on their website, they will say, we are not first responders. Um, if you believe an adult is being abused, you need to call law enforcement. And APS um, 
inherently has different standards because they are working with adults. And adults have free will and can say, no, I'm not being abused. You need to go away. And unless there's a cognitive delay that um, APS can say they can't make those decisions because cognitively they're not capable of, um, they have to go away. Um, so APS uh, is not as, uh, I don't want to say stringent, but is not as um, powerful, I guess you would say, as Child Protective Services, um, because children can't really, um, children can't make their own decisions. Adults can, I think is the best way to describe that. So let's talk about the categories of elder abuse. Before we get into the forms of elder abuse, we're going to talk about the categories. So there's one category on here that I did not, uh, that your book includes that I did not because we're going to talk about it specifically, um, but that is the intimate partner violence. Um, I put that in with family or domestic elder abuse. So family or domestic elder abuse um, is the most uh, kind of frequent type of elder abuse, and it is maltreatment by someone who has a special relationship with the older person, and the most frequent offenders um, is the child of the victim. And so, like, I, when you look at the type, uh, like, the forms of abuse, uh, you're going to see financial abuse. We see this a lot in uh, family or domestic elder abuse. So this would be children, uh, siblings, close friends, things like that. The next category is institutional elder abuse. And institutional elder abuse is the abuse of an older person who lives in a long-term care facility, nursing home, or residential care facility. And the offenders are employees of those facilities. So if a child maltreats or abuses their elder um, parent inside a facility, it is considered family elder abuse. But if the facility staff mistreat uh, the victim, then it is considered institutional elder abuse. So institutional elder abuse is really um, maltreatment by the staff of the institution. And then finally, you have this new category called self-neglect or self-abuse. Um, and you really only find this in uh, elder abuse. And so uh, essentially this states in later life, this refers to the inability or failure of an older adult to adequately care for his or her own needs. So they're not able to um, uh, bathe or... Uh, seek medical attention, or they're unwilling or unable to take their medicine as prescribed, things like that falls under self-neglect and self-abuse. I'm going to talk about the six forms of abuse uh, that we see in elder abuse, and these are going to look very familiar uh, to you um, because a lot of them we've we covered with child abuse and the definitions are pretty much the same. Uh, they're just applied to uh, persons 60 to 65 and older. So the first form of abuse is abandonment. And abandonment is the intentional and permanent desertion of an older adult in any place. So hospital, nursing home, shopping center, dropping grandma off on the side of the road and saying, I can't deal with you anymore. Goodbye. Um, or leaving the person without the means or ability to obtain necessary food, clothing, shelter, health care, or financial support. So abandonment is essentially abandoning a person who is unable to meet their own needs um, and uh, leaving them without um, the proper ability to, to meet their own needs. So then you have physical abuse, which is very like exactly the same as child abuse, physical abuse, um, but it's essentially inflicting or threatening to inflict physical pain or injury on a vulnerable older adult 
or depriving that adult, adult of basic need. So physical abuse would be breaking grandma's arm or punching grandpa in the face, something like that. Uh, then you also have sexual abuse, which we're going to talk a little bit more about sexual abuse, but um, sexual abuse is exactly the same. Um, the vast majority of victims were females and were highly dependent upon um, someone to take care of their needs. And the vast majority of perpetrators were male care providers, so institutional care providers. Um, you will see that uh, sexual abuse happens pervasively in institutional settings. Uh, about 81% of the uh, perpetrators were institutional workers. Um, and then family is your next leading um, category of perpetrators at 78%. But uh, older victims are less likely to report sexual abuse than their younger victims um, and act the acts of sexual abuse range from sexual exhibition to inappropriate touching, photographing the person in suggestive poses, or forcing the person to look at pornography. Um, when we talk about sexual abuse, it can involve rape, sodomy, or coerced nudity. Um, and there are certain indicators to sexual abuse, much like child victims, that adult victims will... will um, will have. And so um, you may see physical behavioral um, issues, but you will also see sexually transmitted diseases starting to pop up with older adults um, who have been sexually abused. So you may start seeing um, chlamydia, gonorrhea, things like that, where you know the individual is not really sexually active. Um, because believe it or not, nursing homes, there are extensive sexual activity that goes on between the residents. I will never forget my grandmother being sexually active in a nursing home. Um, but um, if you know that um, the individual is not able to be sexually active, um, but then starts getting STDs, uh, that's a strong indicator, or STIs, I should say, is the new term. Um, that is a strong indicator um, that sexual abuse has happened. So then you also have emotional abuse, which is the willful infliction of mental or emotional anguish by threat, humiliation, intimidation, or other abusive conduct. Um, much like ch uh, child victims, uh, this is the most difficult type of abuse to identify. It includes verbal or nonverbal acts, uh, such as like name calling or using intimidation, uh, things like that. Uh, I'm going to skip financial exploitation for a minute and go to neglect. So neglect is the refusal or failure by those responsible to provide food, shelter, health care, or protection for a vulnerable adult. Um, we see warning signs like sunken eyes or sudden loss of weight, extreme thirst. Bed sores are um, a really big indicator um, in older adults of neglect. So they're left in the bed. Uh, they may soil themselves and not be cleaned up properly, things like that. And um, bed sores start to happen. This typically occurs when a caregiver is unable or unwilling to provide necessary care for an older adult for whom they're responsible for, and can even occur when there is no willful desire to inflict pain. So neglect um, can be un, un, uh, what is the word? Uh, can be accidental neglect, but it's still neglect. Um, so some symptoms that you'll see is withdrawal or denial of health services, um, untreated injuries or illnesses, uh, lack of proper hygiene, things like that. All right, so now I want to go to financial exploitation. Financial exploitation is um, a form of abuse that is that we see solely in elder abuse. 
And so financial exploitation is essentially illegal taking, misuse, or concealment of funds, property, or assets of a vulnerable adult. So um, we know that older adults typically receive um, financial benefits, so they can receive Medicaid, Medicare, um, Social Security, things like that. And so financial abuse is essentially um, misusing those funds um, so that the elder person does not get those funds. Um, experts have described financial exploitation as an epidemic with society-wide repercussions. A 2010 study estimated that financial exploitation cost older adults at least $2.9 billion a year. And uh, Burgess talks about this notion of power of attorney. And power of attorney is something specifically within that can lead to financial exploitation. So power of attorney is something you need to know. And it is essentially the authority granted by one person to another person to act on behalf of that person. So um, my uncle, uh, who recently passed away, uh, was not able to really make decisions for himself. And so he granted my dad power of attorney. So my dad would be able to make decisions for him, medical, financial decisions for him, take care of his property, all of that while he was in the nursing home um, and be able to act on his behalf uh, with all, with everything. And so um, you can see how that can be problematic if um, your intentions are not good. And so there are specific requirements for um, power of attorney so that it can uh, lessen the likelihood of exploitation. So if you are a paid provider, like a nursing home, a social services agency, something like that, it is against the law to be a power of attorney. You are not able to be a power of attorney if you are also a paid by the individual. Um, and so uh, that is supposed to lessen the likelihood of like this conflict of interest. Like you're getting the check um, and paying all the bills essentially. And so um, the thought behind the requirement that it has to be someone who is not paid um, uh, is essentially so that they, it's less likely that there's some financial abuse that would go on. All right, so let's kind of talk about uh, spousal abuse or intimate partner violence and elderly abuse. 58% uh, of perpetrators of elder sexual abuse were intimate partners. Um, older women were twice as likely as older men to be killed by their spouses. Um, and there's a lot of thoughts behind why um, intimate partner violence is so prevalent uh, with elders. Um, with the elder population, um, and it really kind of goes back to the culture that they grew up in. And so you really kind of look at a lot of people 65 and older grew up in a patriarchal society, and patriarchy was really like the common social norm, whereas we kind of rebel against the patriarchy and things like that. Um, a lot of women became wives and mothers during the pre-feminist era. Um, and so they solely believed it was their responsibility to take care of the house and um, kind of uh, do their husband's bidding. And their husband was the head of the household. Um, in fact, most women uh, married young and had never really lived alone. Like they married straight out of their parents' home, uh, houses. Um, most of them never really finished school. Um, or if they did, they didn't get any type of advanced education. And they really didn't have to work. And so um, their job was to take care of the house and raise the family while the husband worked. And so a lot of um, female older adults did not get job training. 
They never learned independent skills to manage finances or negotiate contracts like leases. Um, they never really interacted with lawyers. And so they become more secluded um, and uh, more reliant upon the male in the relationship. And so we start to see reasons why intimate partner violence can be more pervasive in these situations um, and why they don't leave in these situations. Now let's look at abuse by children. Um, hang on one second, let me write down this timestamp. So we know, I'm sure everyone has seen The Lion King and kind of and, and knows the song, The Circle of Life. And you know, as the circle of life kind of happens, children um, fall into the role of caretaker to their parents, um, just as their parents took care of them. And so the parents typically become dependent and um, the lack of autonomy of elderly persons can make it very difficult to end the abuse. So um, you see children who um, lose their independence because they're having to take care of their parent. Um, and so uh, you also see um, children not knowing how to deal with mental health issues such as like um, Alzheimer's, things like that. And so um, it, it becomes very easy to kind of see um, some of the issues that go around with abuse uh, by adult children. There are typically two types um, for explaining why uh, this happens. So adult child is dependent on the victim for financial assistance, housing, and other support. So um, you typically see um, adult, in this type of offender situation, you see um, an adult who never really flew from the coop um, and is solely dependent on their parents. Uh, and so as their parents start declining, um, it becomes easier for the adult child in that situation to kind of exploit that situation. So they may uh, start uh, doing financial exploitation and things like that and start taking their parents' money. Um, or as drugs have become kind of a common, common uh, commonality in our society, I have seen it to where children steal their parents' drugs to get high and things like that. We also see the inability to kind of cope um, with the declining health of their parents um, and not having really the mechanisms to cope with like Alzheimer's, dementia, and things like that. And so as mental faculties decline in, a, in older adults, um, they can become violent. And so uh, we see abuse starting to happen with children who are required to take care of their parents, um, not being able to cope with, with that mental decline. And so that increases maybe physical abuse, um, things like that. Institutional abuse. And remember, institutional abuse is the abuse by faculty of the institution or employees of like the institution. So when we say institution, we're talking about the nursing homes, long-term care facilities. Older adults who are abused while they are residents of long-term care facilities are essentially victims of institutional abuse. Uh, these are typically the most vulnerable elderly individuals and the individuals who don't really have a social support to help them. So their children may not be able to care for them or they may not have children. Uh, 30 Six percent of nurses and nurses aides have reported seeing at least one incident of physical abuse perpetrated by a staff member in recent studies. And 10 percent of staff members in institutional settings have admitted to physical abuse, while 40 percent admitted to psychological abuse. Those are staggering numbers. Um, almost half have admitted to some form of psychological abuse. 
And uh, your book kind of talks about some of the causes of why institutional abuse happens. Um, it's on page 468, so please make sure you take a, a look at that. Um, some causes ranges anywhere between, um, these are private facilities that um, there's not really uniformity across uh, long-term care facilities around policies. And so, and even when there are policies in place, uh, staff burnout makes them makes these facilities um, lack staff. There's severe staff so shortages, and so um, they typically take what they can get in a lot of situations and may not have well trained staff or or like the cream of the crop staff. And so enforcing these policies may be lax because they don't want to create any more burden upon their staff. Um, so you're also going to read about financial structures um, that typically re reward low cost means. Um, and so essentially what that means is um, they're going to typically, not all, typically uh, institutions are um, going to go with the low cost measures um, so they may not have the highest quality tools beds things like that read something about societal neglect and societal neglect is essentially um, exactly what it says neglect based off of societal resources so we don't have a lot of great public policies in terms of elder um, wellness. Um, there's a lot, there's a lack of adequate resources um, to deal with um, elder Americans as they um, reach retirement and then start having health issues and things like that. Um, if they're childless, there's really not a, another choice but to go to a nursing home. Or if their children can't or won't take care of them, there's not a lot of resources around good, adequate care. And so all of these are really kind of neglectful practices that we have in society um, that uh, make up societal neglect. So you'll, you'll read about self-neglect, but really this portion is asking you to kind of look at it from a... a a macro level, uh, which means a big picture level. Um, really, since 2010 and the older, uh, the older uh, elder justice initiatives, um, there really hasn't been any legislation to kind of curtail elder abuse. All right, so in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through each one of the typologies of sexual offenders against the elderly, um, but I will say, please make sure you read this section. There's a lot of great information as to offender typologies um, of those who commit sexual abuse against the elderly. Um, you're going to see that these kind of correlate with what we know about normal sexual abuse um, offenders. So opportunistic rapists are essentially those that just have the opportunity um, to sexually abuse. They don't care if they're male, women, uh, male, female, anything like that. Um, the pervasive anger rapist is essentially the same thing as when we talked about sexual abuse. These are the ones that um, are highly violent um, and use violence in everyday common um, common dealings with individuals. The sexual type rapists are the ones that are specifically um, in it for sexual gratification. So your opportunistic and pervasive and really vindictive rapists are all about power and control. Your sexual type rapists are essentially those that rape for sexual gratification. And you'll see that there are two types of sexual uh, uh, sadist. Um, there's the overtly and the muted. 
and then you have the non-sadistic rapist. Uh, so make sure you pay attention to those. Um, vindictive rape type rapist, I will say this and highlight this, um, they can be confused with the power or with the per pervasive anger rapist. Um, but the thing that separates them is the vindictive type rapist essentially only targets women and makes their anger toward their women. They essentially do the rape um, as a means to degrade, demean, or injure women. Whereas the pervasive rapist um, will rape males and females. All right, so we're kind of wrapping down. We're on our last two slides. So um, I wanted to make sure I included this. These are factors associated with the risk of abuse. Um, what I will say about this at, is um, greater abuse happens as more impairments occur. So if there's a physical impair impairment, limit, limited mobility, um, things like that, um, the victims are less able to defend themselves or may not be able to communicate um, the, the rapes as well or the abuse um, as well. Um, so as you kind of see um, impairments occurring, you kind of see vulnerability increasing for different types of abuse. All right, and finally, uh, your your chapter kind of uh, wraps up with um, interventions that we've put in place. Uh, you will see that there's more educational programming, more um, more spotlighting of elder abuse going on, um, just to raise public awareness that this is something that um, is happening, and these are um, highly vulnerable individuals, just like children are highly vulnerable, elder adults are vulnerable as well. And so uh, society kind of needs to have an awareness of this going on. Um, we have seen a lot more accountability on uh, long-term care facilities uh, and kind of um, taking abuse more seriously. Just like uh, Child Protective Services, there are manda mandatory reporting requirements um, for Adult Protective Services. Uh, we've seen the increase in use of Adult Protective Services. Um, and then we have specific domestic violence programming. Um, we know that intimate partner violence, domestic violence is a growing, um, a growing issue in uh, the elderly population. And so, we have recognized um, that uh, older adults are victims too. And so uh, just as with normal, I would say, quote unquote, normal adult victims of domestic violence, uh, there is a growing recognition that elderly adults uh, need to have access to shelters, legal advocacy, and more law enforcement training. All right, so I promised you I would keep that as short as possible. It's about 40 minutes. Um, I hope you all have a great week. Um, and if you need anything, feel free to reach out. Have a good one.